Well, friends, in this season, as we've been working through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been reframing the questions that we're asking. Encouraging to ask not only what are we going to do and when, but who are we and who is God leading us to become? You see, the purpose of Jesus' teaching in the sermon is to shape a community that will be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, a city set on a hill. And so when heard in that context, all that Jesus talks about, his discussion of anger and of lust and of divorce and of deceit and of hatred, all those topics take place within Jesus' overarching concern for the church's vocation, to be a light to the world, to make disciples of all nations by exemplifying and living and speaking the righteousness that he so deeply cares about. Now, last week, Jesus talked about anger, and this week, Jesus talks about lust and marriage and divorce. He addresses us this week, that is, as sexual and relational beings, seeing the sexual and relational aspects of our lives as those things that fall within the domain of discipleship to Jesus. Now, before we get started on these topics, I just want to acknowledge uh, at a personal kind of pastoral level that I know that every one of us has been affected in some way by lust and divorce in our lives. And I have seen firsthand the, the kind of pain and confusion that this can bring into our world. And I'm also really aware that in a season of pandemic, of increased isolation, of un increased uncertainty and confusion, that like there's a lot of stress that have been put on people whether single or married in the season. And there's a lot of stress that relationships have had to bear. So I just say this and acknowledge this up front because I want you to hear what I'm about to say. And I think what Jesus is trying to speak to us is coming from a place of deep empathy and compassion, while also at the same time believing that the truth of Jesus' words will really set us free. So let's talk about lust first, and then we'll move on to marriage and divorce before uh, concluding comments. So Jesus talks about lust. He says in verses 27 and 28, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. Now he's referencing here the, the seventh commandment. But I tell you, says Jesus, that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now we see Jesus doing something similar to what he did last week with anger. He gets underneath and goes to the deeper stuff that lies underneath anger. And here he is doing that with adultery. Jesus expands the definition of adultery to include not only the act itself, but also the internal desires of the heart and the intentional look of the eye. Now, for, for some, I think Jesus' words about lust actually come as quite a timely corrective. I remember driving on the road the other, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody was going into quarantine, and I, and I saw a billboard in Los Angeles um, that had a kind of a seductively dressed woman on it with the words and quote, come spend quarantine with me. And it was just another way in which marketers were trying to tap into this quarantine into an opportunity to kind of tap into people's sexual desires and, and distort them. And so I think even in the midst of what we're going through, Jesus is speaking a timely word to those of us in our community and our world who find ourselves stuck in cycles of lust in this season. And he's speaking a preventative word to those of us who find ourselves playing with fire um, in unhelpful ways. Now, it's important to realize that as with all sin, lust is a corruption of something that is fundamentally good. And that is that we have a good desire for beauty and intimacy. So I don't read what Jesus is saying here, speaking against sexual desire in any way, but rather against lustful and adulterous desire. The specific word that Jesus uses actually carries the connotation of a willful, sustained looking with the intent of possessing another person whether that's actually physically or whether that's just imaginatively. And so what Jesus is talking about is something that is a distortion of the way that we're supposed to relate to other people. Jesus is commending an others honoring and others protecting ethic where we're able to recognize the beauty and the value of another person for what it is, not something to be possessed, not something to be exploited for the purposes of our own self-gratification, 
but as something to be cherished as a gift and reflection of God himself. I think it's important for us to recognize that as divine image bearers, we are naturally drawn to beauty. And as divine image bearers, we naturally long for intimacy, and those are good longings. Um, when rightly oriented, beautiful things are meant to kind of reflect God's character to us and help us long for, for who he is. And when rightly oriented, intimate relationships are meant, kind of meant to reveal something about God's love and faithfulness and fidelity. Um, so I think one of the things that's important to recognize, I think, here is that in addressing lust, Jesus is not saying that a desire to behold beauty or a desire for relational intimacy is bad. But what he is saying is that those desires can be distorted in such a way that we want to possess another person for our own sake and our own self-gratification. One of the uh, prayers that I think um, is really helpful in this comes from the book Every Moment Holy. And he's got a series of prayers for like everyday stuff that's uh, their liturgies for practicing the presence of God. And I think he totally gets it right here. He realizes that our temptation to lust is actually a distortion of a good desire. So we should see that temptation as an opportunity for that desire to be expressed rightly in worship to God. So he writes this, this prayer to say for upon the sight of a beautiful person. And he says this, Lord, I praise you for the divine beauty that is reflected in the form of this person's life. Now train my heart so that my response to their beauty would not be twisted downward into envy or possessive desire but would instead be directed upward in worship of you, their creator, as was your intention for all such beauty before the breaking of the world. So I think Jesus is acknowledging the lust and the distortion of good desire in us. But then Jesus is drawing a close connection between the way in which the desires of our heart and the movements or the glances of our eye are deeply interconnected. Uh, throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus often speak of the heart as the source of human speech and human action. But here in the Sermon on the Mount, G Jesus seems to suggest that our eyes are often the way to our heart. In other words, our imagination is the way to our desires. And I think Jesus is saying that lust often grips the heart through what the eyes see and through the imagination. So, Jesus says, we need to pay particular attention to what fuels and shapes our imagination. And we see him talk about this in verses 29 and 30. He gets pretty intensive. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So Jesus advice, cut out of your life that which is causing you to sin before the sin itself takes over your whole life. Now, I, I read Jesus' words here as, as being parabolic in the sense that he's not literally recommending that we dismember ourselves as some of the early church fathers believed, which led to some detrimental actions on their part. But I do believe that he is dead serious and that he literally wants us to be very ruthless about cutting out and dealing with the sin in our lives. So if watching a movie causes you to sin, a particular type of movie, cut it out. If reading a particular genre of literature causes you to sin, cut it out. If going to that particular part of town will tempt you to sin, then cut it out. If surfing the internet at a certain time of night will cause you to sin, then cut it out. And the list could go on according to the particular particularities of each person's life. Now, to some, this may sound prudish. I think to the world, it often sounds prudish. But I, but I think Jesus is just saying, like, 
this is the reality. And if this is the reality for you, cut it out. And that is godly wisdom. And Jesus is, is speaking here, I think, not just because he, he's a prude, but because he wants to be someone who purifies our imaginations and protects our hearts. And Jesus is someone who wants to help us foster meaningful and truly satisfying relationships in our life. I had the privilege while well, I served as a minister in Canada for a number of years to work with um, groups of young men who were struggling with pornography addictions. And one thing that I learned is, is not just how lust leads to, eventually leads down the road of, of viewing pornography, but how viewing pornography actually shapes one's social imagination in ways that are really hard for for youth and for people to actually perceive. It makes it really hard actually to have healthy embodied relationships. Because what pornography often does is it trains one's imagination to view people through the lens of consumerism and secrecy. It teaches one to view relationships through the, through the lens of kind of acquisition and pursuit of sexual experiences. And you give into it for long enough, and what ends up happening for some people, especially in my generation or younger, who have the internet, is that fantasy, sexual fantasy, really quickly replaces real, meaningful relationships of actual intimacy. I, I think John Mayer said it really well in 2012 in an interview. He said, he was very honest. He said, I'm more comfortable in my imagination than I am in actual human discovery. You see, I think Jesus speaks to us the way he does in the Sermon on the Mount because he loves us. And he wants us to foster and enjoy real and enduring relationships of intimacy and fidelity. So he says, cut out anything that is going to cut away and erode your relationships. Now, a pastoral word here. I, I know from walking with many people, I know that feeling stuck in some sort of sexual addiction or lust addiction is, is one of the most difficult places to be. It is so hard. It is unimaginably, unimaginably painful, and especially in its secrecy. And I know, know that when people are in that position, what you wanna hear is not just cut it out, but you wanna know that there is actually hope for redemption for you. And I wanna tell you that there is. Jesus speaks to you the way he does this morning because he believes that there is actually the capacity for transformation in your life because the spirit is at work in you and wants to create a clean heart and mind and imagination in you. So if you're feeling stuck and you just don't know what to do, I really want to encourage you to talk to somebody. I am more than available. And I think you will find a compassionate, not judgmental, hopeful presence because you need to know that there is hope for deliverance in Jesus. Friends, that's Jesus' word on lust. But then he goes on to talk about marriage and divorce. Now, I think it's intentional that Jesus talks about marriage, divorce only after talking about anger and lust first. Because if we actually look at the causes of divorce so often in marriages, they often revolve around the nodal points of anger and lust in those relationships. Now, Jesus speaks quite strongly here, we must admit, against divorce, except in, in the, the case of extramarital kind of sexual infidelity. It's not the only word that we get on divorce in the New Testament, and I'm sure you're going to have a lot more questions than answers when I'm done talking about this. So if you want to talk about it, talk, come join the Zoom conversation after the service. Be happy to engage more over this. But Jesus, in this particular patch, passage, broaches the topic of divorce from a very specific angle from the perspective of the husband's actions toward his wife. Now, there's an important reason for this in the Jewish culture of Jesus' time. It, by Jesus' time, in Jewish circles, women were often looked down upon and not treated very well. They were treated like property that could be kind of taken or given away by, a simple, by simply issuing a certificate of divorce. Now, this is still true in some places around the world 
women didn't have many rights to divorce themselves, almost none in Jewish circles. In kind of Greco-Roman circles, they had a little more. Um, men were allowed to be prom promiscuous, but women could not. Prostitutes were looked down upon, but the solicitor was not. And so what ended up happening is that this certificate of divorce that Jesus touches upon, which is a reference to Deuteronomy 24, which was originally intended by God to be a, a document of legal protection for women, um, Jewish men were using this as basically divine permission to divorce their wives and get a new wife whenever it seemed fit to them. And there were some schools of rabbinic thought that actually believed that, that a husband could actually do this over anything. Like there's examples that of, of in Jewish writings that if she burnt, uh, if a woman burnt her husband's food and proved to be an incompetent cook, the husband could divorce her. Or if the, the husband just simply lost interest in her and found another woman more attractive, he could divorce his wife so he could move on. And so whereas the Mosaic law, Deuteronomy 24, was originally given by God to be a protective measure for women, it seems that some Jewish rabbis were encouraging people to interpret it as a permissive measure, giving husbands the ability to basically do whatever they want. So when we hear Jesus' strong words on divorce here, I think we ought to hear them as a prophetic rebuke of this abuse. In other words, Jesus is protecting wives from being the victims of the sinful whims of their husbands. And he is speaking a strong word to husbands. You cannot divorce your wife for any reason you want. She is not your property to buy and to sell, to use and to dispose of as you want. She is a gift from God, I think we should hear Jesus say. To be cherished in total faithfulness, excluding all rivals, to be loved in total endurance, in sickness and in health, and until death do you part. I think we hear Jesus saying, like, your personal feelings and desires do not determine the validity of your covenantal commitment. But it's the other way around. Your covenantal commitment ought to shape your personal feelings and desires. Now, that's the first thing that I think we should hear Jesus saying in these strong words on divorce. But I think it goes, Jesus' words go beyond protection against divorce to also include a, a kind of radical affirmation and celebration of God's original creative intention for marriage. And I think we see this when, when we see Jesus' further expansion on this teaching later in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 19, verses 3 to 6. The Pharisees come to Jesus and test him, kind of posing a similar question to what Jesus addresses in the Sermon on the Mount. They say, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And Jesus, in response to their question, just totally ignores it and reframes it. <laughs> he says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And, there, and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then Jesus continues, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What God, therefore, has joined together, let no one separate. And so what I think we, we see Jesus doing in Matthew 19 that adds to our picture from the Sermon on the Mount is he is, is saying that you are interpreting this law totally out of context. Like you need to understand what God said in Deuteronomy 24 in light of what God said in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And when you go back to God's original creative intention for marriage, you see that he intends it to be a total communion of one whole man and one whole woman in a committed lifelong covenantal relationship. And so Jesus goes back to the goodness of God's original design, and he, he affirms it as holding true. And then he says, you need to understand everything that God then goes on to say about divorce, say in Deuteronomy chapter 24, in light of his strong, deep, original desire that there would be covenant faithfulness in marriages. And I think we could add to this picture going on to Revelation 21 and 22 and seeing that the new creation is depicted as this great marriage between Christ and his bride, the church. 
So it's like not only God's original creative design is this image of covenant fidelity in marriage, but God's like ultimate eschatological redemptive intention is this image of fidelity in marriage. Jesus is affirming its goodness, even though it's deeply costly and difficult. Jesus, I think, is reminding us that God is the enabler of married love and commitment. Willpower is not going to sustain marriage on its own. It takes God's deep, original creativity and redemptive intention for marriages to be sustained. And so Jesus here is, is speaking not only against like trite and flippant and utilitarian views of divorce that don't take, understand God's heartbeat for marriage in its full seriousness. But Jesus is also, I think, speaking to us, knowing that there's deep pain and brokenness in marriage and that marriages are in deep need of his healing grace. And he's speaking to us and saying, stick with it. Keep pressing on. Keep throwing yourself on the forgiveness and the hope and the life that I want to bring into your life because I care about this relationship that you're in. So Jesus speaks to lust and then he speaks to divorce. And the question that I come away with is like, how do we receive and respond to Jesus' words? In an age when lust and divorce is so widespread and, and so much of us, so many of us have felt the pain of it, not only in our culture, but in, in our church. Like, how do we receive and respond to Jesus' words here? And as I keep saying throughout the Sermon on the Mount, anytime we read any portion of it, we need to go back to the first line. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first thing we need to do is we, as Christians, need to admit our spiritual poverty and our brokenness and, and just rest in the forgiveness of God for us, that he meets us in our poverty. And he proclaims over us that the kingdom is ours, even in our brokenness. The second way we respond, I think, is, is by seeking to be and to cultivate and to foster a community of character formation. I think of the rest of the Beatitudes. Like we need to foster being a community where people learn how to respond to the sins and shortcomings of others, especially their spouses, with gentleness and mercy where we learn to long for right relationships and make things right where they are wrong, where we learn how to seek the purity of heart that will free us from anger, that will free us from lust, and that will free us to be for each other in ways that we are not currently experiencing. And a community of character formation where we learn to act as peacemakers when we are in situations of conflict. So first we need to admit our spiritual poverty and then we need to cultivate a community of character formation. I think third, we need to name the dynamics of anger and lust in our lives really honestly, because that's often what erodes our marriages and our relationships. Seeking reconciliation where it's needed and healing where it's needed, counseling where it's needed and forming new habits of grace. Fourth, we need to companion ourselves to one another as followers of Jesus. I'm, I'm quite interested by the two, only two places where Jesus speaks about marriage and divorce in the whole Gospel of Matthew. The first one is in the Sermon on the Mount, where he sat down a group of his, of his followers, of his disciples, and taught them what it's going to look like for them to be a community that follows him and walks in his footsteps. So divorce is spoken of in a communal context. And then when Jesus addresses divorce and marriage in Matthew 19, it is in the context of Jesus giving instruction to his disciples about how to relate to one another in the church when relationships get difficult in the church. And so there's this sense in the, in the places where Jesus talks about marriage and divorce that Marriage is never meant to be this individual, isolated affair. It is meant to take place in this community of Jesus followers who know that they need support, who know that they need perspective, who know that they need encouragement, who know that they need each other. 
I mean, Susie and I often joke that we would have never got married if it wasn't for our church community helping us get to the point of being married because we, we struggled to get there and, and we needed a community that supported us and that encouraged us and that um, gave us perspective when we were feeling like we were in tough places and not understanding each other. So the importance of having a community. And the final thing, how do we respond to Jesus' words? I think, I think we need to trust that Jesus here, even when he speaks very directly, speaks words of truth. And trust that the truth will indeed set us free. The truth indeed will set us free. So Lord Jesus, would you give us a deep delight in your truth? Would you give us the gentleness to acknowledge it? the graciousness to walk into it, and the hope when we fail, and the assurance of your forgiveness, Lord. And so, my brothers and sisters, I speak these things to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.